Um, well, cheers. We uh, I can propose or share the agenda I thought we would do here, yeah. but I'd also love just to do a, a little check-in and let people kind of sure. settle into the space. So um, sure. we can do a check-in and some introductions so you know who you're talking to. And then I thought we could share a little bit about building belonging, sort of what this initiative is that we're trying to do and where we see your work kind of connecting to it. Um, we'd love to see hear how that lands for you uh, if we're way off base. And then there's a specific invitation, um, which is why I'd asked uh, Richard for the connection in the first place, around what we're calling conversations on transformation. And so it's basically, um, what is the role of technology in scaling democracy? So a lot of the work you've been in for a while and uh, we have a couple sort of specific items there to discuss, but that's kind of our general proposal. Does that sound okay? Yeah, sounds great. Um, so I can start for a check-in, which is it's inauguration day here in the U.S. It's been a, I'm sort of trying to hold the polarity between um, feeling grateful and also this isn't it. We ha we haven't arrived. There's just an important step along the way. So I'm trying to find that balance. And my kids were just running around outside right before this call, so they may join us at some point. Nicole? Yeah, yeah, I, I think we feel a huge sigh of relief today at the peaceful transition of power. Um, and it's a beautiful day here in Berkeley, California. So uh, I'm excited to like take a walk later. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, as for me, I, I literally just woke up. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I think, I slept for nine hours and 10 minutes. Uh, so one of the longest slept, sleep I've had uh, in, in weeks, actually. Uh, and I'm feeling pretty great uh, and looking forward to the conversation. And right after the conversation will be the cabinet meeting. And after which um, there's a, a long space like I don't know, four hours uh, doing nothing. Uh, so it feels quite luxurious, actually, given the schedule for the past few weeks. Wow, spacious, a rare treat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was trying to explain to my uh, five-year-old, I said, well, I'm gonna talk to this person who's a minister. He's like, what's a minister? I was like, well, it's kind of hard to explain, actually. It doesn't make a lot of sense to kids. Some really. of the preachers and hear confessions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't even have that context. We're, uh, yeah, I'm afraid we're, uh, <laughs> um, well, cool. Uh, I thought we could do just a, a little introduction on who you're talking to, so you have some context for what we're about to say to you. Um, so my sort of super brief story of self is a uh, middle child, so second of four kids, grew up here in Southern Oregon on the West Coast. And uh, I came from a family of lawyers, so I'm the only male in my family who's not an attorney. My dad and my two brothers are all lawyers. And I went to undergrad and um, wrote a thesis on alienation. And the question I was asking at the time was, uh, if things are as bad as they seem to be, this is the US circa 2000, in college 2000, 2004. So I was there for 9-11, um, sort of post WTO protests of 99. And the question I was asking was, where are the social movements? Like how come we don't have um, broad-based social movements uh, in the US? And we did have some, I mean, there's stuff around WTO. Um, we a lot of mobilizations around the Iraq war, but both of those, to me at least, felt as if they were complaining about what we were doing over there somewhere else and not really looking at what we were doing right here. So the answer I explored to explain that sort of gap in action was alienation, that people are separated from their own sense of power, agency, each other, the land, right? Um, and after graduation, I got involved in human rights work and anti-genocide work. So I graduated in 2004 it was the time of Darfur in Sudan. I had this sort of, you know, naive, perhaps middle child belief that, you know, surely in the 21st century, we could agree not to kill each other in mass. Felt like a, a low bar for humanity. And did that work for a couple of years at a nonprofit, went to grad school for conflict mediation, looking specifically at peace processes and how do you resolve political violence without resorting to it. So informed a lot by the Rwanda experience, Bosnia, Northern Ireland, uh, some experiences in Africa. And then I spent five years at USAID, so in the federal government, um, in the Obama administration, working on conflict management and focused specifically on the Horn of Africa and the Great Lakes. And then I was stationed in Myanmar in 2012 and 2013 during the, you know, air quotes, uh, democratic transition there. And yeah, uh, and I think the experience I had to kind of like fast forward to the present was um, I had a critique of the aid industrial complex 
but I largely exempted myself from it because I was like, well, I'm one of the good guys. I'm still doing good work here. Um, and in Myanmar, for a bunch of reasons, which we can get into if you're interested, I lost faith in my ability to know whether I was doing good or causing harm. And that was a really destabilizing um, place to come to for me. So quit. And my wife and I moved to Seattle. She was and is at the Gates Foundation. I joined the Gates Foundation for a couple of years um, as a transition, knowing I wasn't going to last there for a bunch of reasons, which I'm also happy to get into if you're curious. Um, and then quit in the early 2016, specifically because I was concerned with the rise of authoritarianism globally. Um, so, you know, it was the Trump primary campaign here, but you know, Bolsonaro was coming, Johnson was coming, Brexit was, you know, a few months out. And there was something about um, gender and authoritarianism that I wanted to understand more deeply. And my experience in sort of the countering violent extremism and conflict management world was that um, most of these people who were drawn to these movements were male and were drawn and motivated by a sense of belonging. And that ideology was always second or third. And so I was interested in sort of that connection and also the resistance movements, the social movements I wrote my thesis on back in the day had materialized. They were here, right? Occupy and the Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter and Me Too, um, Sunflower Movement. Uh, and was curious about um, a lot of those movements seem to be led by women um, and youth. And so just there's an interplay there that I want to understand. So all that in the way of context uh, that led me to building belonging, but let me um, pause there. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, would you say that today's or yesterday from his uh, inauguration uh, symbolizes a step uh, toward non-authoritarianism? It's a complicated question. Uh, yes, definitely insofar as it slowed the slide toward authoritarianism in the U.S. But what narrative we take away from that, what lessons we draw, what success looks like. I'm concerned that a lot of, for a lot of moderate people in the U.S., white people in particular, it'll be a little bit too easy to say, okay, that aberration's behind us, you know, move forward. Um, I think the story is a little more complicated than that. So, you know, the fact is 74 million people still voted for uh, someone who is by any metric an authoritarian. And so for me, it's good news that 81 million people didn't, uh, but it's hard to claim a, a clear victory there. Well, yeah, and I, I also think that, I mean, in the minds of a lot of Americans who have, who believe fake news, they don't think that the current presidency is a legitimate one, right? Which mm -hmm. is, and then for a lot of younger, more liberal folks, they don't think Biden represents them. And so mm -hmm. in their sense, it's also not it is a legitimate presidency, but it's not mm -hmm. a representative one. Uh, and so mm -hmm. in that sense, I feel mm -hmm. like there is a right. lot of so It feels like it's slowed down, but a sense of well belonging uh, is yet to be built. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Very so cool. I can introduce myself a little bit. Um, so I'm a civic technologist uh, and Taiwanese American. Uh, started off working in nonprofit digital capacity building back at Civic Hall, uh, and then did some research uh, in DC, working to inform policymakers on uh, digital transformation and what they should be thinking about with regards to the future of work and AI ethics. Um, and then most recently, uh, I launched a new resource called platformabuse.org, which is a knowledge source of technological harms and mitigations to guide safer mm -hmm. development. So uh, we're trying mm -hmm. to make information about things like uh, trolling and, and downvoting, mass downvoting uh, and other forms of harassment uh, that a lot of minorities might experience more accessible to your average UX designer or developer uh, who isn't necessarily well versed in these mm -hmm. issues. Sorry, the website is platform. Platformabuse.org. I can share. Oh, abuse of abuse. Okay, okay, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Uh, and so I'm interested in both the positive and the ugly parts of the internet. So first of all, in my work with Brian, thinking about how do we build spaces for more and deeper connections digitally, and what what type of digital infrastructure is does our democracy need right now? Uh, but then also, you know, with projects like platformabuse.org 
how do we face the harsh reality that people will always use these tools to mm -hmm. hurt? Uh, and tied to both of those questions is this interest in tech access. Um, so who are digital tools being made for? Uh, who has access to them and understands them? And the idea that the tech sector itself can't solve all of these problems, some of which is created, some of which it hasn't, but is kind of exacerbating or magnifying. Uh, and we haven't really done enough, at least in the US, to make it feel accessible to your typical citizen who maybe isn't an engineer. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'll turn it back mm -hmm. to Brian to talk about the organization. Mm -hmm. I like the, the, the wordplay, abusability testing. Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> abusability testing and mitigation. Yeah, well, so I, from, uh, one of my collaborators uh, is very interested in privacy engineering, and so we're definitely hearkening to other similar mm -hmm. language from that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I know some other uh, industry that refer to their customer as users and abusers. So, um, yeah. <laughs> So uh, I feel we have a bit of an unfair advantage knowing a bit more about you because you have a more public profile, but if there's anything else you'd like to share beyond what we might already know, okay. please feel free. Sure. Um, so um, I, I wasn't quite kidding when I when I said I mostly uh, preach and sometimes hear confessions and also write poems, I guess, prayers. Uh, and so I call myself a poetician uh, and I'm a lowercase minister. Uh, and so if you look at my Twitter profile, uh, it's digitalminister.tw, but I very rarely uppercase the, the M. Uh, and to me, my, my work really is with the government, not for, with the people, not for, with Taiwan, not for, uh, and mostly just making sure that uh, idea was spreading, spread. Uh, I, I guess that's the, the summary of how I see my work. I'm really happy to um, connect and to um, kind of lift uh, this narrative out from this naive uh, individualism that strips uh, individuals out of belongings, uh, which is, I think, the, the root of the kind of user slash abuser uh, mentality, because um, only when individuals are treated as like deprived of their social connections could uh, the AI become truly authoritarian intelligence. Uh, that is to say, AI doesn't enslave people or alienate people. Other people um, enslave people through AI. Uh, and so uh, my, my uh, usual uh, way of um, rephrasing that is calling AI assistive intelligence. Uh, it could assist a collective intelligence. It could assist a small community, but just like my eyeglass is assistive by being aligned to the values of me wanting to see better uh, uh, instead of see some advertisements pop ups and also uh, to be accountable in the sense that I can repair it myself or find my friend to repair it without paying for um, astronomical license fees. So that's how I see my job. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to have Nicole here because I'm not a technologist, so I have to feel out of my depth when uh, we start tipping into the tech space. But I think part of the, the aspiration for this connection this and the conversation we want to set up is in part out of recognition that these these sectors are way too siloed. You know, that you have the tech conferences with technologists and then democracy conferences with folks who deal with democracy and uh, yeah, trying to create some hybrid ground that is multi intentionally multidisciplinary and trying to draw on some of the skill sets and insights from lots of different spaces, including uh, poetry and, and art. Um, I think Nicole and I both saw you speak a little bit in the uh, new public gathering, whatever that was, I guess last week, time flies and thinking about right what is the digital infrastructure but who decides and it can't be just technologists yeah and, and ways for community organization and facilitation to me are also technology i mean they are applied social science uh so science and technology for me is not just about natural science and industrial technology for the record mm -hmm. Love it. um so let me do just a couple minutes on <clears throat> what we're trying to do with building belonging and then obviously feel free to interrupt and then we can get into the a specific invitation for you. So building belonging was, um, yeah, born out of the concern with the rise of authoritarianism and an interest in sort of this, the common thread uniting the move towards um, far-right nationalism globally and paradoxically animating the rise of um, social justice movements is a quest for belonging. Like that seems to be sort of a core narrative uh, thread. 
And so what about that? And can we have more of this belonging and less of that belonging? Um, so part of the aspiration in building belonging is can we create an us without a them? And uh, we think the answer is yes, but frankly, uh, the evidence does not necessarily support that belief. Um, so I'm uh, actually, if Skype will let me do this, I'm going to share my screen for a second, give you something to look at. Uh, that theoretically should be possible. Do you see that? What do you see? Oh, I do. Uh, okay. So I'm not sure exactly what the screen is showing, but yeah. So the first quarter of insight was, um, this is partly where I, when I left the Gates Foundation, I was looking for this question, which is basically, if you take climate as a, for instance, um, it's not enough to remove or, you know, reduce carbon in the atmosphere. You actually have to solve biodiversity loss, water scarcity, ocean acidification, right? Um, these are all part of that picture. So that's what I mean by comprehensive. And then the holistic must be actually has to be adequate to the scale of the problem. So if we're talking about uh, degradation of the, earth, of the earth, we actually have to have solutions that are commensurate to that. So this is basically a call for transformation rather than, you know, reform. The green circle there is, you know, you can read the science as well as anyone. Uh, you know, we have 10 years until the Antarctic ice shelf breaks off. So what are we doing um, if we expect to have results in that time? And then the third is um, population scale, right? Like the pandemic makes this painfully obvious. We need 8 billion vaccines and probably many more besides. So anything short of that um, isn't going to be sufficient. And so this question for me is... Um, both motivating uh, and also very daunting. And, it, and it maybe that's not possible, right? Like a lot of the questions that we face, the trend lines certainly are not super encouraging. But for me, it was quite clear that I wanted to try and I wanted to try to work with other folks who are also trying in different ways. The second kind of insight was this one, um, which is basically a recognition that <clears throat> transformation at every level impacts transformation at other levels. So my experience as I was kind of doing this landscape work prior to launching Building Belonging, was that you go over here and do your therapy work, right? Your mindfulness, your somatics practice, individual transformation, you go over here and do your equity work, your anti-racism training, or you your sort of conflict resolution work. And then you go over here and do your systems change work, your complexity thinking. And the obvious reality that, of course, all these things are interrelated, right? We can't remove a person from their social context or the systems and institutions that would be apart. Why don't we sort of develop some um, practices that acknowledge that reality? Mm -hmm. So, the way we get at that, I'm not saying this is the answer, this is just our hypothesis that we're exploring and testing, is um, through this concept of the fractal. So my own introduction to that was through Adrian Marie Brown and her work on immersion strategy, but it's not, you know, it, it comes from lots of different places. And so it's basically the notion that how we are at the smallest level is in fact how we impact the system at the largest level. And so at the level of micro interactions, you know, this conversation as one instance, um, but there's another sort of thing that we're also experimenting with, which is, can we create a small group? So have that as the unit of transformation, have it be curated as a fractal of the whole. So it has to look like the world we want to live in, um, you know, in terms of representation and different uh, experiences represented there. And then how we hold the space has to be consistent with the world we want to live in, which none of us have experienced, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and then can we um, practice those ways of being in that small group and connect to others who are also doing it? <clears throat> understanding that none of us have all the answers, but what you're doing in the technology space and what you know Richard is doing with small group work, what you know Mickey is doing with sort of global governance you know, theory, um, all has something to say about the same issue set. We bring those people together around those questions. So we don't know how to do that, um, obviously. Uh, the effort is to experiment at this fractal level and see if we can get the pieces right, you know, with big air quotes around it, because, you know, I usually talk about sort of directionally accurate. Can we feel like we're going in the right direction? We don't exactly know where we're going, how to get there. And the question for me, like the, the, the biggest dot, 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 is I'm pretty confident that we, or one, if not us, can do this at the level of 20 people, even 50 people, maybe even a couple hundred. Uh, you're doing it at the level of a, a city or perhaps a small nation state. Uh, yeah, a million. Yes. <laughs> right? I mean, so how do we do it for seven and a half billion people um, with appropriate humility about the scale of the challenge and the different contexts in which this work needs to get done? So nobody knows, but it's quite clear, at least to me, that technology is a piece of the answer, like it or not. And most of the technology that's out there right now doesn't really serve us or that aspiration. So I was interested in your work and, and Polis and sort of aligned efforts around how do we distribute democracy as much as possible 
Mm -hmm. one of our partners, one of the groups we work with, um, a group called Societal Platform based out of India, talks about um, distributing not the solution, but the ability to solve. So can we create a, a platform that people can then you know, adopt and uh, apply in their local context? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of abstract talking. Let me pause there, see if Nicole wants to add anything or if you have any questions or comments. I, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I guess just building on that. Uh, so Brian kind of left off with saying like as part of this work, one of the big questions that we think technology can help with is the question of scale. Uh, so we're currently already within our community having small group conversations about belonging, um, creating kind of a community of practice around belonging where there are people who study network weaving, um, people who study different issues related to this topic. Uh, and how do we turn that into more of a global movement? Uh, and also as we're trying to scale, uh, I think what Brian is very mindful of is like creating a community that's inherently anti-hierarchical uh, and as we're starting to make our first decisions about this community. So, for example, is the current platform we're on the right platform? Uh, you know, who should be the stewards of this community? We're also trying to figure out like what types of tools we can maybe integrate into this type of decentralized decision making process. Uh, and, and again, particularly as we scale, because right now we don't really need it since we're not large enough yet to need it, but um, thinking ahead to what lessons we might be able to apply from your work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So um, just to, to check my understanding. So uh, this idea is supposed to be a, a in-group with no out-group, uh, right? Everyone has the potential, uh, and this is similar to how I call uh, my community is the homo sapiens community. Um, it has more or less the, the same symbolic um, value um, in, in this. Uh, and uh, the technologies that we are using, uh, like right now, I mean, it could be Zoom, it could be Skype or things like that, are, are not that bad uh, for this purpose. Skype uh, actually has a, a um, group view mode uh, that puts us uh, in a um, virtual background side by side. Uh, the experience likes us looking into a large mirror together uh, and that uh, builds a sense of belonging and so on. So the designers of these two dimensional video conferences spaces are also uh, more or less working on the same um, dimensions uh, because otherwise you know fatigue and so on is, is a real thing uh, and so beyond which uh, I don't really see uh, any issues really uh, with the current generations uh, of technologies uh, when one want to scale it uh, because it sounds like you're, you're not really scaling it up right where you're scaling it out or scaling it deeply in the sense of basically it's just a idea with spreading um, spreading uh, and uh, so, so I, I'm, I'm less clear in how exactly the kind of apply software technology is going to be used because I firmly believe uh, we only assist uh, the, the the people whenever people feel a, a longing uh, for uh, for something to uh, to be automated, for something to be done, uh, because it doesn't feel like human work. It feels like uh, machine work. That's, you know, alienation, reification, and so that. Uh, but but in, in uh, your description, I, I don't quite feel anyone uh, saying or you say, relaying anyone saying that they're uh, doing very repetitive work that they would rather not doing uh, and in which case I am not exactly sure how technologies in the sense of digital um, software uh, would help on this regard. Yeah, I think it's a, <clears throat> for me, a, a, the way I think about the two levels of this um, is the world we move in, most people's experience of belonging is not belonging, right? Like that's unfortunately how it tends to resonate with folks. And the idea of belonging, the felt experience of belonging um, for most people is not part of their lived experience. And so there's something powerful about uniting around that that brings folks together. I think everyone has that experience. And our digital spaces reflect that. Our digital spaces are not good at cultivating belonging. It's hard to find a space this is my experience, uh, hopefully you've had a better one, uh, that embodies belonging. And the ways we tend to do it are either very flattening, partly of necessity through the technology, but also, I mean, to Nicole's point, like they're not designed for access, they're not designed for 
uh, radical inclusion. They're designed by whoever designed them with whatever their frame of reference was at the time. And so we're interested in how do we, you know, we have no choice but to move from offline to online and back, right? And have that be a, a dialogue. And that's partly what was attractive to me about the V Taiwan experiments. But if I'm pretty confident that with the right set of folks involved, one can curate a container of belonging. And we're sort of seeing that happen right now in building belonging, I think, I hope, I trust. Uh, the question is, how do we scale that seven and a half million people? I don't know how to do that. <clears throat> I don't, I'm not sure it can be done. But can we find technology that cultivates that same sort of spence, sense of relational intimacy and promotes the kind of um, behaviors that we want to live into, right? So norms around harm, around uh, accountability, around equity. And right now, you know, I like your frame around assistive intelligence, right? It, it tends to perpetuate whatever, you know, I think of it as like power, right? Power amplifies and reflects. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't corrupt. It just is what your underlying tendency already is. So I think for me, I understand the question of how do we use technology to scale the experience, the felt experience of belonging, and to what extent is that even possible? Um, and then, you know, there's a, at the other end of that, part of the way I understand belonging is it requires co-creation, right? It requires you to be part of it, otherwise you don't belong, right? You're just a spectator. Uh, so how do we instantiate that? How do we make that real? And I think part of what I am attracted to in your work is the possibility of distributing decision-making and having that be the experience both of belonging and its companion significance, right? You're, you not only belong, but your decision and your presence matters. And I think um, if we don't figure that out, the other side, not that I believe or not some of them, but if we're juxtaposing democracy and authoritarianism, uh, authoritarianism is finding a way to give people significance in a way that is dangerous. And a lot of the online spaces that have emerged oh. support that um, are actively trafficking in a form of significance and belonging that I would argue is, uh, is quite harmful. So can we offer a different experience um, that is consistent with our values and allows people to sort of move online and offline without having to, yeah, and then still be able to belong? Nicole, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I think just to reiterate, I think a lot of folks in our community are not super excited about the of like about the potential of for example all just joining a slack channel or all just joining a facebook group uh, these are folks who want to imagine different ways of being in community with each other online so are there ways for example that um what brian was talking about earlier with the fractal how can we enable small groups and the intimacy of that small group but also scale. So those small groups can kind of learn from each other. Um, how can we kind of replicate, for example, mutual aid networks um, online and that type of like decentralized uh, movement online? Uh, and so, yeah, I think it's we're it's very much people who are hungry to experiment, I think, with newer platforms uh, and in particular, I think like the the decentralized decision making portion is really important to everyone. And I think that's the piece that we're struggling with more because it feels like just a, a poll, right, isn't quite enough to to really capture everyone's thoughts and opinions. Uh, and it, a forum can feel a little too linear. And so um, that's why we're kind of looking for more outside solutions. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, Polis is free software uh, at PLL.is, uh, and it's uh, free uh, as in freedom and also free as in beer for uh, nonprofit groups uh, as well. So, so that's something one can try. But um, so, but but my core point is is this. So, um, when when we're having this dialogue in the very beginning, uh, I said that um, I'm requesting your permission to contribute a transcript and or the video recording to the commons, and and that's. Uh, for me, co-creation. Uh, that's for me making materials uh, for the future generations uh, to to create. Uh, and and I think um, that's for me uh, feels um, 
be, like belonging, right? Even though I don't know the people who will remix um, our conversation, I had interviews remixed into rap songs uh, by the Japanese uh, band Dos Monos, uh, and in any of which way, right? <laughs> but but to, to me, uh, this is fundamentally about giving up control. Like, like I, I don't really know how it will be remixed. Uh, and, and that uh, paradoxically uh, makes me feel more secure because I, I don't need uh, to be a, a author and therefore not authoritarian, I guess. Uh, and so um, that's, that's one observation. Uh, and um, it doesn't have to be online. Um, for example, the, the, the buy nothing movement, right? The, the buy nothing movement is about fundamentally the call to action uh, is to, to rethink um, economy from scarcity to abundance, right, or a gift economy. Uh, and again, there is no single platform. There is just a pattern uh, of whenever I feel the need of something instead of buying it online or offline, I just ask my um, community neighborhood in group, um, you know, do you have that sort of thing um, around? Uh, and again, um, this is a, a pattern that could be replicated on any platform and the platform choices um, grows out of whatever existing platforms the neighborhoods are using. And then only when we feel the limitation of these platforms, uh, then we extend it uh, or augment it uh, into other uh, newer developed platforms, so always with a very clear use case uh, in mind. So uh, I hear you when you see say uh, that the decision making uh, collectively uh, is something that people would love to experiment and um, but but what sort of decisions I am still not very clear on that uh, because for for example by nothing the decisions uh, would be how to um, you know ensure equity right how to make the accounts accountable uh, and there are of course decision making software for for those uh, but uh, for building belonging uh, certainly this is not yet uh, around the you know um, the, the scale that uh, you would need to track each and every interaction uh, for, for analysis or, or for ensuring equity or ensuring that hours will spent are equitable. So, so what sort of decisions are you looking at uh, when you talk about collective decision making uh, that affects the current uh, group? Well, I think there's a lot there. And I, I think I would sort of separate out like the specific challenges we're, we're working on right now inside Built and Belong, you know, exploring things like sociocracy and different ways of you know, dealing with decision making. I think the the connection to your work and sort of the broader question of scale, for me at least, is, you know, right now, if you want to make a collective decision around climate change, for example, how do we do that? It goes to the UN, maybe gets a veto, nothing happens, okay. Then you go to the G7, have some, you know, horse trading there, uh, gets watered down, maybe takes some input from nonprofit groups, nothing happens. And you end up getting, if you do get a solution, the Paris Accords were, you know, let's be honest, like a really great achievement totally inadequate to the challenge. Um, so that's the status quo. What's better than that? And how do we make it real? And I think a lot of folks are working on it. And I guess the only thing I would like maybe spin or play with on what you're saying is, I wonder, and I'll, I'll frame this as a question. Um, so we're in the business, I think, of um, catalyzing, cultivating, encouraging, nurturing emergence, right? We want a better world to emerge. And mm -hmm. Um, I wrestle a lot with like, <clears throat> what is the verb that precedes emergence? And for me, it's also what is the verb that precedes belonging? Because mm -hmm. I chose building belonging. I chose building for a bunch of reasons, but it's I'm actually not wedded to it. It's not the right verb because at some level we all belong, right? Like we're here. It's, it's just mm -hmm. a reality. Um, and for emergence, I think my question or my my sort of like struggle here in this thing and just and just hearing your response there is like, I don't know that we have the luxury of letting go of total control. Um, because the other side, again, with air quotes there, um, is not. And people are um, looking for answers. And I think sort of a more energetic intervention is needed there, whether you call that cultivating or catalyzing or whatever the, the right verb is. But for me, it's like, we don't have the competencies to do this. Um, maybe, you know, in 10 generations we'll get there, but we don't have 10 generations. So how do we build the collective competency to make better decisions as individuals, as a collective? And my sense is like the maybe just a pivot here or to offer the, the connection to the conversation on transformation is it's now clear from a whole bunch of different disciplines emerging that we actually know more or less what it takes at each level of sort of this I, we world, right? Individual transformation, societal transformation, systems transformation. 
And we now know, for example, stuff that I didn't know as a kid, that if I don't have the ability to emotionally self-regulate, I'm not going to be very effective, right? I just, if I get constantly triggered, I won't be able to have meaningful interpersonal interactions. I did not get that skill set as a kid. So here I am as an adult trying to figure out how to do that, right? Um, that's not enough. I also have to have, have to have the ability to navigate conflict. If I cause offense, um, not only do you have to have the ability to let me know, I then have to have the ability to respond and repair the harm that's been caused. I also did not get that skill set as a kid. <laughs> uh, part of my draw to mediation. So I think we now have emerging fields of practice that are saying, hey, there's a thing called semantics that really emerge your practice. There's a thing called conflict transformation that really should be a basic skill set we get as five-year-olds. There's a thing called, right, and even work around gender, right? Like I grew up in a very specific binary. Right now, my kids are like, they ask, you know, he, she, or they. So there is progress happening, but uh, it's not fast enough for the challenges we face. So for me, part of the point of the conversation on transformation is to say, hey, look, if you're out there struggling like the rest of us, here are some of the folks who have um, consolidated the field of practice that has some offerings. So for me, belonging, John Powell is, in my view, sort of the best in the world at thinking about belonging. Does he have the only perspective? Of course not. But if you're going to learn from someone, he's a good place to start. Uh, when it comes to thinking about democratizing technology, Audrey and a sort of folks that sort of you're in the orbit of are about as far along as anybody out there. Not to say that you figured it out, but if we're going to learn about how to do these processes, why don't we learn from the folks who have sort of um, made it the farthest out there in this wilderness? And not only that, but let's put them together. So for me, the it's less about decision making per se. I mean, decision making is more at the end of global governance when it comes to like how do we deal with climate change as a that, that, that's uh, exactly right it, it's at the yeah. it's the end of the uh, the decade of action right it's maybe nine years down the road uh and and if we jump to the mindset nine years down the road uh, i'm not exactly sure it's um, a good bootstrapping point yeah yeah so i think maybe just to make the the sort of invitation a bit more explicit maybe that'll be a helpful way to ground it so the idea here is we've had a set of conversations, 15 so far, there's a plan total of 20. And basically it's, um, if you're coming along, you know, the metaphor I use is we're heading up a mountain and um, we don't know if the mountain's climbable. It may not be, right? maybe not in our lifetimes, but we're trying. And we know that there's a set of things we need in our toolkits and our knapsacks, right? You know, water, food, clothing, right, compass. And uh, none of us has it all, right? You might have the water. Nicole's got the food. I've got the back, you know, the backpack. And so let's go to those folks who are sort of at the peak of their field. And I hesitate to use words like expert or leader because, you know, but nonetheless, some folks are farther along in their own explorations. And so let's learn from John about belonging. Let's learn from Audrey about, you know, the, the application of civic tech. Let's learn from Mickey about sort of thinking about global governance and consent-based practice that is non-hierarchical and non-authoritarian. Um, and then that's an offering. It's just it's just to put in the backpack and pick up what works and, and leave what doesn't. So we've had a set of these conversations around somatic, sort of cultural healing, power, um, equity, some of these things about these are things we have to be able to reckon with as a species, as homo sapiens, <laughs> if we're going to live in the right relationship with the earth and each other. So we increasingly know this. It's not an exhaustive list. You know, we can play with it for sure. But one of the questions that I feel like is out there, so one of the remaining conversations, the one that we would invite you into, is how do we think about um, the relationship between our little fractal work, our small groups, things like building belonging or you know, what Richard's doing with micro solidarity? How does that rack and stack into some sort of uh, global governance structure that allows people to meaningfully participate in decisions that impact their lives, like climate change or you know <laughs> anything for that matter? Uh, and leaving aside like the specifics of the construct, which could vary and should vary from place to place, is there a way to scale some of those core operating principles that allow people to say, oh, I see what you're doing over here. Let me let me take that and, and apply it. And so I think your kind of core ethos, like the way you show up in the world around transparency and around sort of um, the spirit of co-creation and generosity that other people can riff off of is actually, I think, a big piece of this. And so the idea would be, what would it look like to have you in conversation with other folks who are experimenting with different pieces of this question, sort of what ought a democratic governance structure look like at a global scale, leaving technology out of the picture? What ought, um, and I even hesitate to use the word ought, but what might uh, an aspirational view of uh, a small group fractal look like in relationship with others that is scaling up to some broader whole that is not just a top-down, you know, uh, traditional structure? And how do those things relate to each other? So some of the folks we have in mind, you know, you, 
Richard, um, Anthea Lee, who runs this organization called Reboot. They're different. They're experimenting in different places along that spectrum. And our hope is to say, can we have a collective conversation about what is the relationship between your work and Mickey's work? Mickey's not a technologist. Um, she doesn't understand sort of the space that you're in, but she has important, I think, offerings to bring to the question of how do we use a tool like Polis to greater effect? Let me pause there. Mm -hmm. But is this about the, the mountain or is it about a, the journey? Uh, is it about a ring or about the fellowship. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the point uh, I'm trying to make uh, is that, um, I mean, for climate crisis, there, there's another school uh, that basically say, let's just get a bunch of uh, climate engineers, right? Uh, like uh, reduce the, the solar uh, radiation to earth and, and boom, uh, problem solved. Or there's another bunch of people working on Mars colonization, no planet, no planet crisis. Uh, and, and so, <laughs> Basically, um, what I'm trying to say is that if we frame it around a crisis, um, a particular crisis, and there's always that person uh, that will come along and say, why don't we just we fly helicopters to the top of the mountain or into the Mount Doom or, or whatever. And, and and they kind of, by definition, became our out group. But you just say we're an in-group with no out groups. Uh, and so there, there's this kind of philosophical um, tension uh, if we organize our journeys around one particular uh, crisis. But otherwise, I, I, I hear you. Uh, this is fundamentally about um, conversations around our um, competencies and so on. Yeah, and I think, you know, how transformation happens, right? Like, I think there's, um, you know, my own kind of lineage of, of study and practice has been around sort of nonviolent movements, right? You know, Gandhi and Dr. King and um, the anti-apartheid struggle. And there are a set of principles that are discernible and replicable. And they've worked very effectively in different contexts. And so are there lessons that we can draw from that and apply different in different ways and different technologies? And a lot of what honestly happened in, you know, in Taiwan and in Hong Kong last year is really inspiring. They're applying a lot of sort of this best practice or emerging practice, let's say, um, and allowing people to sort of spin off of it and build. And to me, that's the whole point. It's like, why start anew each time, right? Like, why, why don't we learn from what they did in Serbia and learn from what they did in Egypt and learn from and not say that this is the answer, but there's a set of principles that actually are, I would, you know, seems to me quite replicable and uh, sort of directionally accurate. And the problem is no one of us, you know, the field of nonviolent protest movement is an entire ecosystem that has lots of different sort of pieces to it. And that's not enough. We also have to have this other piece over here around somatics practice and healing. And we also have another piece over here around narrative and communications. And nobody can hold all that space. We just can't. So for me, part of the fractal is intentionally curating the folks who have, again, the right uh, set of competencies that we collectively need to have. And again, that list is going to be infinitely large. But, you know, the point of the conversation with transformation said there's a set of 10 or 15 that we have to have. If we don't have these. There's no way we make it up the mountain. Um, doesn't mean we will if we do have them. But, you know, Nicole, anything else you'd add to that? No, that was great. Yeah, and uh, I guess the only thing that I would add is, uh, I think in addition to the uh, these gatherings that we're planning and these conversations, we want to also think about how we bring other folks into the conversation in a substantive way. So we will have a curated panel of folks and we're hoping we can be one of them. Uh, and we will also extend an invitation to folks in our network, folks outside of our network, um, who want to then continue engaging in that conversation and uh, basically form a small group, um, a small cohort of people who are technologists and outside of technology uh, to kind of take these principles uh, or like best practices that you all lay out and play around with them in the coming weeks. <clears throat> yeah, that that I can do. I I started saying that as long as it's in the Creative Commons, I'm I'm game. I'm happy to participate in such conversations uh, as time allows. Um, and also, if you need uh, the resource to make like um, you know copy edited transcripts out of these and so on, I can provide that as well. Cheers, thank you. No, I think I'll speak for myself, but I think for Nicole as well. I, mean, I really just appreciate the spirit of generosity with which you do everything you do. It's it's re it's really inspiring, and I think 
unusual. Uh, I will tell my my daughter that you are a lowercase digital minister. And I'll bring in the, the poetician. Lowercase so digital and lowercase minister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, I mean, one kind of, uh, I appreciate that you named the uh, longings or the this action begins the longing. I think one that I've been kind of orbiting towards for a few years is like, the only thing I know in the world is good things happen if you bring good people together. And so the question has been, how do we create a container that brings the right set of folks together in the right container with the right, you know, facilitation to lead to some better outcome? And it has to do for me with this question of what is the verb that precedes emergence? You know, I could, you know, Audrey and other good people in the room, I'm sure good things will happen, but will enough good things happen? Are, are we holding the space in a way that allows the fellowship to make it into more, you know, or are we setting them out for, for uh, falling short? And with appropriate humility around that, to me, it's a question of like, I know part of like one of the dreams I have is in addition to this conversation on transformation, which is sort of bounded around a topic that you're already expert in. Um, the meta the other metaphor I sometimes play with is, you know, we're entering a cathedral and you walk in through one door, you know, your expertise is civic tech. And I come in over here through, you know, gender and authoritarianism. John comes in over there through you know, racial identity formation. And we all find ourselves in the cathedral. So you know, how'd you get here? I know I came that way. Where are we? We look up, you know, it's actually not a cathedral, maybe it's a mosque, maybe it's something else entirely. Um, but each of us has something to do with how do we take this next step. And so for me, it's like Tyson Yunka Porta. Do you know Tyson's work down in Australia? He's an indigenous practitioner who's done a lot of really cool work around with humans, you know, the, the riff on Homo sapiens is uh, he sees us as a custodial species. So let's not stop with Homo sapiens. It's, we have a role, but let's not forget the rest of the species of which we are, you know, part of the broader ecosystem. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. I understand. Yes, and, uh, mm -hmm. And then there's a gentleman named uh, Sanjay Parohi, who's um, one of the architects behind Societal Platform, this concept. Mm -hmm. And Sanjay um, thinks about population scale in the context of India. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where Taiwan is a few million, India is, you know, uh, over a billion. And he thinks about, for him, the metric of success for the rollout of a policy or program is, can it, you know, does it reach a billion people? And if it doesn't, it's, it's not, frankly, good enough. Um, for what their government needs. So sort of part of the thing is like this question of scale, I think is really bedeviling for folks. And there's a resistance in my communities um, and social justice communities in particular around scale sounds like white supremacy. It sounds like capitalism. It sounds like growth and metastasizing. Um, can we hold an aspiration to work at scale that rightly rejects some of the, uh, the archetypes that we've been given to think about scale? And so I'm interested in what would happen in a conversation with you um, thinking about bringing sort of a technology lens, Sanjay bringing a societal platform lens, Tyson bringing a species lens, anchored in kind of indigenous traditions, John thinking about, John Powell thinking about narrative and power um, and how uh, you know, he talks a lot about building a bigger we. So it feels to me like I access all of your work and I see the connections, you know, with the limitation of my own, you know, sight. And I'm like, wouldn't it be better to bring the people in dialogue with each other and see what, what resonates for you and what might emerge from that conversation? And my sense is like, I'm not quite confident that, you know, to put any two of you in a room would be great and each of your work would be influenced by the other for obvious reasons, three or four or five, if we hold that space well. Um, it seems to me there's some powerful lessons for what each of us is trying to do in our own small ways, if we could only benefit from and draw on each other's work. So, mm -hmm. it's not, that's another kind of like aspiration about what's behind, you know, we have this first conversation of four people who are already to some extent in some relationship, right? You already know Richard, but that's a gateway to a broader conversation that is more intentionally multidisciplinary and more intentionally diverse around, you know, uh, mindsets and paradigms and, you know, frameworks that people are bringing to that conversation. And the effort for me and for Nicole and for building belonging is can we provide a common language belonging um, for you to be able to communicate with each other, right? Because, uh, yeah, pause there. Yeah, I, I want to <clears throat> return to the, the mentioning about scale. Um, well, <clears throat> when we talk about scale, I guess in a lot of uh, the social justice groups, people think about industrial scale, which is about scaling up. Right. Or, or web scale, which is about scaling out. Um, but what, what I hear you um, 
especially around this uh, custodial species work. Uh, to me, I would refer to it as scaling deeply, uh, as in geological time scale, like scale not as in space, but as in time. Uh, and uh, so maybe it is not about reaching all the Homo sapiens currently alive, but rather about the Homo sapiens that's to come, uh, and also the species that's to come after Homo sapiens. Uh, and and we, if we uh, phrase scaling this way, I mean, in geological time scale uh, kind of way, uh, then a, a lot of the, the tension uh, disappears because when you talk about seven generations uh, benefit, then obviously the economical prosperity, environmental sustainability, social justice uh, converge seven generations down the line. Uh, and it is only when we talk about the next quarter or next decade uh, do the, the term terminology of scale uh, brings tension as a, it's a simple observation. Yeah. Yeah, that resonates. Um, moving towards close here, Nicole, other thoughts on what we've been talking about or anything else you want to make sure we have on the table before we wrap? No, I think I'm good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think, I mean, a couple of concrete proposals for next steps. So one is um, we'll circle back with the rest of the folks involved in this and try to, I think the challenge that I experienced and was talking about with Nicole earlier is how we bound to this topic in a way that allows people to access it because there's a lot here you know global democracy tech scale belonging um so we think we have a way into it but we'd love to run that by you and make sure it feels like something you can um, dive into and have folks be able to access um so we'll come back with that sort of proposed pairing of folks and what that proposed topic might be and get your thoughts on does that does that resonate does that feel like something you can speak to mm -hmm. um there is an aspiration sort of what nicole talked about of instead of having this be a one-off ad hoc thing that lives on YouTube or wherever, can we also think about using that as a vehicle to connect communities that are currently not connected? So when Nicole and Brain so earlier, she was talking about some groups in Detroit that are really thinking about access in an interesting way. Audrey, you obviously have connections to all kinds of interesting folks. Um, what would be some interesting combinations or, you know, I use the word remix earlier like that. So who might we choose to remix deliberately um, and see what can emerge from that? So, I'm not sure exactly what to do with that, but that's an aspiration. Um, and then the third thought is, and I'll, I'll just sit on this and um, maybe we can come back to you later if it resonates, is this, I, I talked about as a fractal of fractals. So this this conversation I'm sort of trying to put together with, with John and Tyson and um, Richard and Adrian Marie Brown and some other folks around how do we bring together these different ecosystems of, you know, sort of societal healing and thinking about democracy in a deep way. And um, I think your work, uh, as important place to play there. I don't feel like I understand it enough to speak very articulately to it. So it'd be better to have you in the room <laughs> and speak for uh, how you see it connecting or where you don't even. I think part of that is, um, is also fascinating. So if that's of interest or if that's a group of folks you'd enjoy to play with, um, we can also keep that in mind. Sure. Uh, sure, I can definitely follow up through email uh, on, on that particular aspiration, uh, and I'm happy to be remixed. Uh, I'm not uh, yet uh, quite clear uh, how I would work as a remixer uh, in a community, um, mostly because uh, I don't quite um, currently have a inkling of how to um, how to reconcile this. Um, this time scale uh, differences. Uh, I mean, the, the decade of action narrative and uh, intergenerational peacemaking uh, uh, narrative are, are fundamentally two different uh, time scales. Uh, and um, and I, I did witness that uh, when you move more on the shorter time scale, there's like naturally a them, a, a out group, uh, a mm -hmm. kind of authoritarian uh, people and so on. And when we move toward the longer term time scales and we're like, yeah, we can we can bring, if not themselves, their offsprings maybe uh, into, into a more um, belonging kind of thinking and so on and attention is is less uh that way and and that that's what we see in conflict resolution all the time right if we extend it into multiple generations and care about future generations welfare there's naturally less violence and tension there uh, i'm not yet clear uh, on which time scale uh do the remixing um actually happen uh but uh in the kind of current um generation of course i'm happy to to meet with people who i already have heard of and certainly have much to learn and, and that part I'm fine with. Yeah, I mean, there's no answer to that. <laughs> I think uh, I think it's a great tension to sit with and hold. And I think I struggle myself with like, 
yeah, how do we think about seven generations out? And what is the directionally accurate next step in this present moment that is aligned with that future vision, understanding all the things we don't see between here and there. And my sense is like part of what I'm trying to solve for or uh, address in some way is the sense that we are all running around putting out these fires, but we're actually not sure if the fires we're putting out are, should we be letting them burn? <laughs> should we be over here? We don't, there's no connection between our, there's insufficient connection between our present action and our future aspirations. And so how do we create spaciousness at every scale to um, the three sort of the other event I didn't show you in that, that uh, slide I was showing you is visioning, which is like future state imagination, um, implementing, you know, how do we do it? And uh, sense making, what, what, is, what is the current state? What is the future state we desire? And then how do we move from there to here to there? And I'm intentionally trying to bring together folks who are anchored in each of those domains and have a line of sight in the other domains because <laughs> it's the whole ballgame. So I encourage you to bring that question to the group and it's a good one to sit with. I, Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for your time and uh, for the work yeah. you do. And yeah, excited to I see what, uh, what might come of this. And in terms mm -hmm. of next steps, um, once we reach out to other folks that we want to bring into conversation with you, uh, we, we want to co-create the, the types of questions that you all will be sure. discussing. So we'll provide some rough framework around it, uh, but would love to get your input and the input of other speakers as well. Okay, awesome. So, um, yeah, uh, and are you comfortable with me just publishing this video? Is there any, like, I don't know, trade secret or <laughs> privacy related issues you would like me to, uh, to censor or, or, or do we just publish? I'm not sure where these things go once they're published, but I, I think I'm good. Yeah. Uh, to future generations, obviously. Uh, <laughs> the creative commons. A, okay. a gift to the, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, into so future sentient beings. <laughs> All right, uh, so, so that's it for now then. Um, live long and prosper. Bye. Cheers, Abby. Thanks so much. Bye.